Well, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us for this COIL conversation. We're really tickled today to have uh, with us Barbara Bickelmeyer from uh, Indiana University, who's going to apparently answer all of the questions Gary promises me on what is ailing higher education. And um, Gary told me this morning that Barbara is just full of energy and uh, great ideas. So we're really looking forward to uh, talking about this topic. I started to write down a list of the, um, the issues that we may want to explore, you know, uh, MOOCs and CBE and CBT and MOOCs, and I, I just, the list got too long. Uh, so Barbara, I know that you are looking at these things, uh, tracking the trends, trying to help us understand where what might we be going, um, how might we get there, and how do we make sense of all this. So uh, welcome to Penn State. Thank you so much. And I, I thank my colleagues, uh, Gary Chin and Nellie Clark Chalman, for uh, making your visit uh, possible. And um, so we're going to turn it over to you. Our format is generally that we do about uh, 30, 35 minutes of, of presentation, and then we'll open it up for communications, uh, interactions. We are going to need to get a microphone to whoever might have a question, so just give me your hand and we'll get one to you. Uh, if you're online, I'll be watching the chat uh, box. If you want to put your, your comment, it will channel your presence uh, into the room and get questions for Barbara. So welcome to Penn State. Thank you. And, and it's my great pleasure to be here. And um, I do want to give a shout out to Gary and to everybody who's been working with Gary to actually organize this. It's a, been a tremendous trip so far and I have a long agenda till about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock tonight too of back-to-back -back meetings so I'm I'm learning quite a bit and I hope that in this presentation I can maybe give a little bit back in terms of uh, what what uh, the big picture is and, and how we're seeing things at IU and how we're moving forward and, and I should say how we're seeing things at IU um, but I will also say that um, I just to give a little bit of history about myself I come to um, the work that I do at Indiana University in my academic administrative role, having been a faculty member in the Department of Instructional Systems Technology in Bloomington for almost just going on 20 years this next year, and having come from the University of Kansas where I served as a visiting uh, assistant professor there for a few years, um, and had been in, in corporate environments. I got my doctorate in uh, what was educational communications and technology at the University of Kansas. So I have been looking for almost 30 years now, it's hard to believe, but I've been looking for almost 30 years at questions around how does technology change academic institutions and how do academic institutions incorporate technology. And that, that started for me actually because um, my graduate program was funded by a brand new startup called Apple Computers, and um, my entire academic um, project and, and my dissertation project was dedicated to studying the first ever computer resource network for teachers in an 18, um, 18 school district area of eastern Kansas to figure out what were these networks going to do to faculty development. And uh, it just kind of went from there. I've been involved in um, technical innovation. I happened to um, start my undergraduate, after my undergraduate degree, I worked for a little company called Cellular Business and I took the first picture of the first cellular antenna in America at Motorola's campus. And then I had a stint between my graduate program and coming back to the university where I um, took a job with a little company called United Telecom. Um, they had purchased uh, some fiber optic cable from Southern Pacific Railroad. Uh, internal communications network and they were going to create a national fiber optic network and if you think about Southern Pacific Railroad internal you will know where the name Sprint comes from. Um, so I have just in the course of my career happened to be in a lot of places at a lot of moments in time I do not know why where I have been involved in technical innovations that have changed um, large organizations and so the, the topic of my conversation today is to think about how technology is changing higher education. And in order to do that, we have to go back a little bit and we have to talk about what higher education is in the first place and how we became what we are and where we're moving. So I'm going to talk to you primarily about factual things, but hopefully I'm, kind of, I'm going to present factual events to you in a way that helps you piece together a bigger picture that you might not have thought about. Um, before I do that, let me just give a shout out to those of you who are 
who are watching this um, out there in cyberspace. And let me particularly say hello to my colleague from IU Northwest, Angela Solis, who um, is a, a wonderful um, asset to the work that I do within Indiana University. I wear several hats at IU. I mentioned the fact that I'm a professor in the Department of Instructional Systems Technology. I serve also as Executive Associate Vice President for University Academic and Regional Campus Affairs. I do the work of an academic administrator convening our seven campuses and bringing them together in terms of academic, um, academic policy and academic programming and academic innovation. And over the last, um, going on six years now, I have also served as the, the now senior director of the IU Office of Online Education. Um, I was the founding director of that office where we brought together um, a, a new function in the university to help strategically organize online education at IU. I'm often mindful in the work that I do um, of something that I actually was my first big aha at an AECT conference in 1997. And I will never forget this moment. I was the discussant for a group of presentations at AECT. And the, the focus of the, the presentations was around how, um, how teachers were incorporating new technologies into their classrooms. And as a discussant, I remember after listening to all these, and one of them was Tom Reeves. We just mentioned Tom Reeves. There were some other really distinguished faculty in our field who were doing these presentations. And I remember as a discussant getting up and saying, what if the real question isn't how do we incorporate technologies in the four walls of a classroom? What if the real question is what are these technologies going to actually do to the four walls of a classroom? And that was my first moment in 1997 where I was thinking it's not going to look the same way in 20 or 30 or 50 years that it looks right now. And if we're thinking about incorporating something into this box, we're probably thinking about the wrong thing. And I'm mindful of Larry Cuban and of teachers and machines and the entire history of incorporating technology into education. And I'm also mindful that there are some things that are different with the technologies that we're talking about now. I am not an extremist who believes that the universities are going away. I don't believe that the tsunami is coming in the way that, that it was presented by John Hennessy a couple of years ago that the tsunami is coming to higher education. I do think that there's some radical transformation occurring in higher education. I don't think our universities are going to look exactly the same way in 10 or 15 years that they looked 20 years ago. And that's the subject of my presentation. So um, let, me, let me go through and let's start this by talking about um, higher education and by talking about learning as we know it. And I, and I want you to just do a little mind experiment. And I want you to go back 5,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 years ago, before there was ever an institution of higher education. And I want you to think about learning. And what we know about 20 or 30 or 50 or 100,000 years ago is that basically, Learning took place just in time, just in place, and just as needed. And that's an important phrase to remember. Just in time, just in place, and just as needed. And that might have been with the cave and Socrates and the guild. Because really, we as human beings, whatever else you think, and I'm from Kansas originally, so I have the word evolved there. And it's, and it's a fraught term in the state of Kansas. Um, but human beings are learning machines, right? In order to do what we do, we're goal-oriented. In order to actually be in this world as we are, we evolve and we adapt. And so whether that's our parents telling us, you know, by drawing on the caves, that big animal is dangerous, stay away from it. Or that big animal is actually really sort of tender right here. So if you're going to throw a spear, go for that angle so that we can eat. Whatever that was, that experience of family and education and family was one aspect. And then there was Socrates. And our first effort at liberal education was people like Socrates and people with Socrates convening in the square talking about matters of civil discourse and democracy and the right relationship of the larger collective to the individual. And then there were guilds. And for most of history, the way people learned about trades and learned how to actually make a living and thought about economic development was in a guild experience, right? So what happened? 
well, so I'm going to I'm going to really do a terrible job of of um, compressing a great book by Thomas Cahill called How the Irish Saved Civilization. And this is one approach to the idea of higher education, and there are many, and there are many aspects. So I'm, I'm, I'm stereotyping and I'm condensing. So I just give that as my, as my um, collective uh, uh, statement here of, of you know, the danger of what I'm about to say. But what happened was, as in the West, and this is a Western story, not an Eastern story, in the West, as we were creating civilization, and as the Romans were there um, creating more papyrus and, and refining writing, and they were creating these beautiful art and architectural artifacts, as they were doing that work, and it was so precious, and the barbarians were coming to the gates of Roman civilization, literally what happened was as the Roman civilization was, was under assault, those very rare and very precious artifacts were picked up by those who understood their rareness and their preciousness, and they were taken over to Ireland for the very reason that Ireland was, was boggy and marshy and hard to get to and hard to trample through. And they literally built ivory towers with moats and gates. I have a picture that I carry with me all the time because I was in Ireland with my niece doing study abroad. This is the first basic institution of higher education in Ireland. That's what it looks like today. That's um, the Clon McNoise on, on the River Shannon um, in, uh, in County Offaly in Ireland. Um, but when they created that, literally there were moats around it. There were ivory towers to it. There were gates that were let down. And what happened was those people who understood the value of those artifacts, those scholars, basically brought those artifact, artifacts there, protected them. People who wanted to learn and understand about civilization, those artifacts, came and the gate was lowered and they walked across the moat over the gate and they basically came in, or over the bridge, and they came in and they learned from scholars and then as they became scholarly themselves, they engaged in ideas about how do we advance this knowledge, how do we refine this knowledge, and the idea of teaching, research, and service and application of knowledge was really born out of that idea of the university as conservatory, right? That's first and foremost what the university was. It was a conservatory, and it taught people who needed to know about the conservation of knowledge, and it helped to grow knowledge so that we could advance civilization as we know it. Okay, so here's the deal when you think about that. The academy is conservatory, the academy, the conservatory is gatekeeper had a whole bunch of unintended consequences. Primarily, and most important when we think about the educational enterprise, the teaching and learning enter enterprise, the, the fundamental unintended consequence of that, and maybe not so unintended, was that there were many, many students who were left outside the gate, right? And, and we all know that, and we've talked about that. We have phrasing around higher education and around K-12 education, around students falling through the cracks. And who do we blame for that? We blame the student historically about falling through the cracks. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, so we had that, and basically what happened, and Mike Melinda wrote a great paper about this, my colleague from IU. Mike Melinda talked about the growth of the infrastructure of higher education. Okay, so you have the conservatory, and you have the library, and then you have classes around the library, and then you have people moving to, to live in this place where they can take classes and access things in the library, and then they need a place to sleep. And then they need a place to be to practice health. And then they need a social environment. And then they need entertainment. And then you draw the life of civic culture. And you need big performance spaces. And then we have sports. And then, and then, and then you grow out and you grow out and you grow out until the logical extension is climbing walls, right, in a great recreational sports facility. So just as the university has grown an infrastructure that is straining under its own weight, all these pressures start to come that force change in the university. So when we look at those pressures, the first one is this infrastructure that I talk about. Not everybody can afford to have what Penn State has on this campus or what Indiana University Bloomington has, right? So what do we do about that? What do we do about the cost of that infrastructure? And what do we do about actually promoting that or containing it or deciding who should have access to that infrastructure and who should not have access to that infrastructure, even more importantly. Then we have shifting student demographics. 
And by that I mean literally as we're, and this is one aspect of the internet I believe, as people are starting to understand that in order to have a good middle class life, they need higher levels of education. And so what you see happening is the socioeconomic level of people attending university is dropping and the tuition is increasing. Literally you can go back and you can look at those trend lines and you can just see that right around where the X is hitting the point where it's costing a half a year or a year's salary for gross tuition, not net tuition, that's when you start to see calls for return on investment. It makes a lot of sense to ask about return on investment when you're putting so much of your money into that. When it was you know, the, the great founding fathers and the, and the big industrialists, when it was the Carnegies who were sending their children to a university, it didn't really matter what the return on investment was because they knew where they were going to work. And they were making a network and they knew what was going to happen. And that portion of tuition was a pittance of their overall family wealth. So why would they ask? But when your family's making $40,000 a year and you're paying $20,000 a year, you need to know. And it's not just that the demographic is shifting. I had a great conversation with Bill Bowen about this. Bill Bowen, you may know, is, is, writes a lot right now. He's President Emeritus of Princeton, President Emeritus of Carnegie, um, or of the Mellon Foundation, and most currently is President Emeritus of the Ithaca Foundation, which is very interested in how online education is bending the cost curve of higher ed. And in, in this conversation, he said, Barb, make sure that as you talk about this point, you emphasize it's not just that the demographic is shifting. It's that the number of students who we're talking about, the sheer number of students who are coming into higher education is drastically increased than what it was 20 years ago or 50 years ago. And that is a big, big factor. That is a big, big thing. It's not that just we're educating a lower SES and, and people who may be less prepared because of their high school preparation. It's that there are so many more of them and they need a place. So where's that going to come? And then there's the shrinking revenue. We're doing that at the point where there's only five revenue sources in higher education. All of them have been shrinking. In the last year, we've seen a little movement to, to the better, but still, basically, our state apportionments are shrinking. Our tuition dollars are capped. Our foundation funds have been shrinking. Our um, funding dollars through, through research are shrinking. And our what we would call aux auxiliary services are shrinking. So now we have less money to have to do for more students, and then we have greater calls for accountability, which I've already talked about. When we in higher education, we who are faculty members, have never had to be accountable to people in the past. We are the masters. You come sit at our feet in the, in, in the ivory tower model. You don't ask us questions. We ask you questions. And now all of a sudden, somebody wants to know the return on investment. It's kind of a hard thing to account for, particularly when you have a liberal arts mentality and, and I don't fault this mentality. I'm just simply stating the history of the mentality of learning should be for learning's sake. And I totally agree with the idea that learning should be for learning's sake in the, in the ideal world. But I don't live in an ideal world. And neither do many of the people who are coming to our institutions right now. So they need to know what is it that they're getting. And then we have disruptive technology. Okay, and by disruptive technology, this is going to be most of um, my presentation for, for the remainder of, of the time that I have. Um, we are coming to a point, we are coming at this at a point where the internet is changing higher education, but it's not changing higher education in the ways that we read about. MOOCs are not going to change higher education. Competency-based education is not going to change higher education, but they're going to be part of the story. And so what I want to do is take you away from the rhetoric that's occurring in the Chronicle or in the New York Times every Sunday or wherever you read about it and talk about what's really going on. Because again, I think when you hear people like John Hennessy say the tsunami is coming, there may be a tsunami that's coming, but it's not coming from the angle that he thinks it's coming from or that most people are writing about. And that's what's important because people who think that MOOCs or badges are going to change higher education are thinking about technology as an end in itself. And we all know, given the work that we do, that technology is always a means to an end. It is never the end in itself. And in this case, technology is the means to the end of education. And we understand something about education that most people don't understand. So I'm going to tell a little bit about that story. So 
let's talk about the impact of the internet to higher education. And I'm going to preface this by saying where I came up with these bullet points that I'm about to show you is that I looked at what the internet did in, in internet 1.0, in the one to many, in the publishing era where really a website was a page that pushed information out to many. That didn't really touch higher education except for our library sector and maybe some, some other sectors. But it did actually do quite a bit to those economic sectors that were information driven. And that might be publishing, that might be recording, that might be libraries, that might be advertising, that could be radio. It did a lot in those places. And it did a lot of disaggregating. So why is it that that didn't happen to higher education at that point in time? Well, that's based on some assumptions that I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, and that has to do with what is education really? And what are the elements of instruction that matter? And what are we thinking about? But I will say, just as a preface to all this, that the first thing that it did to us is, if we were really created as a conservatory, the conservatory is now in the cloud. Talk to your librarian sometime about, about how higher education is changing in terms of our focus around the library, being in the middle of our campus, and who's showing up at the library, and what they're doing at the library, and how we're converting library spaces to understand, first and foremost, our role as conservatory has changed. Now, I don't think that, that, that our role as conservators is changing. In fact, I think our role may be even more important as conservators, because what 5,000, actually 2,000 years ago that happened when um, the, the Romans were moving their artifacts to, to Ireland is that there needed to be people who curated, who understood what those materials were, who understood how to make sense and how to critically think and how to look at the history and how to be anthropological and how to do all the things that we do in higher education. So the role of conservatory is changing, but the role of conservator may be even more important than it ever was before. The other thing that the internet's doing, and I, I personally love this, being an instructional designer and coming from a school of education, I have a, I, I'll, I'll tell this as a story. You have to tell me, like, give me 10 minutes, give me five minutes. I have to tell this as a story. I have a brother-in-law who is on faculty at the University of Kansas Medical Center in the Department of Radiology. We talk often when I go home about how, how medical education is changing. I, I remember very clearly this conversation I had a couple of years with him where he was lamenting the, the death of the lecture. He was talking about how the fact that basically his students were watching his lecture online through YouTube at home, and that was OK with the academic administrators. And he was so upset about that. And he was just talking about the death of his lecture and what a sad thing it was about the death of his lecture. And I had to stop him at one point and say, you know, Lou, you're the only person who's lamenting the death of your lecture, right? Um, and, and, he, and he didn't really like hearing that, but he had this aha moment. And literally, when a student can get a lecture and actually see the face up close and pause and rewind and, and watch it when they have time to watch it and take notes on it in a way that they want to take notes on it, it may very well be better than a large lecture hall, right? It's an affordance of technology. But it begs the question, as soon as we start talking about the death of the lecture, something interesting comes up, right? And people start saying, wow, innovation flipped classrooms. And you all know, given your background just as well as I know, flipped classrooms aren't a new idea, right? What happens in our field is that Gary and I were talking about this yesterday. When somebody outside of our field presents it who has content expertise, it's like, wow, that's a great idea, which we've been doing research on for 40 or 50 years. But the idea of the flipped classroom says, now what matters is interactivity, right? But here's the deal. If you define education as we do and as should be defined, if you define education as someone developing the capacity to do something they could never do before, right? Somebody developing the capacity to do something they could never do before, whether that is quantitative reasoning whether that is problem solving, whether that is developing an argument, whether that is any complex cognitive task. And what we know in this room is that everything boils down to, thanks to Ollie and Charlie and others, boils down to procedures and concepts and rules, right? Those are incredibly complex cognitive tasks and combinations thereof. 
rules of discerning rules, right? Those are all what we do, but we do them with different kinds of subject matter. But if education is our ability to do those things in ways we never could do before, and if that is the rule, the definition of, def of education, and it is, then basically that starts to beg the question about how do people get educated? And what you know, and what I know, and what Herbert Wahlberg knows, and what Tom Reeve knows, and what so many people who have actually done research in our field know, is that what makes something educational is really whatever you call the practice and feedback loop, right? And that, that lecture and demonstration and discussion all just get the student to preparation for practice and feedback, whether you call that project-based or problem-based or whatever you want to call it. The heart of something being educational is that it's highly, inter highly interactive, highly engaging, and highly practice-oriented, right? And I can use this example all the time, and you understand it from the, from the standpoint of flying a plane or having a doctor. You don't want a doctor to actually perform a surgery on you who only got lectured to about it, right? You don't want somebody flying your plane who only basically read the manual, right? But we forget that in higher education because we have been so faculty-centric historically, and because we haven't had to have measures of accountability about what are those learning outcomes and how will somebody be different as a result of that. So the idea of education being defined and us starting to understand that our value added is interactivity and engagement, and that the flipped classroom is really what we should have been doing all the long. But we didn't do flipped classrooms 2,000 years ago because there weren't textbooks, because papyrus was really fragile and very expensive. So somebody had to come and sit with the masters and look at that because they didn't get it anywhere else. Do you know that when the, the printing press was, was created, that there was an, an entirely different revision of higher education because all of the faculty members at that point in time were really, really aghast at the idea that books would be given to people to read, right? That was another transformational moment. So now we're coming to this point about recognizing what we really have to add value about is interactivity. One of my favorite things that I ever heard Daphne Kohler say, and I've had a number of conversations with Daphne Kohler, one of the founders of Coursera, Daphne Kohler did a presentation at the Aspen Institute uh, two years ago, and I was at this presentation. And the thing that she was most excited about with, with one of their first MOOCs was that students were starting to convene together in self-organizing groups in cities all around the room, or all around the world, to talk about what they were reading in their MOOC. And I smiled and I said, yes, and we call that a university, right? That's our value added. That's what we do. Okay? So then we've got this whole aspect of redefining expertise. My brother-in-law, Lou, thought that expertise was what he knew. And so that's how he should be spending his time. You read all the articles in the Chronicle of Higher Education everywhere about the fact that people in business, people hiring the students that we, that we create and the, and the alumni that we create, are saying that people are not prepared for the jobs that they're doing in the world. And Yet about 75% of all academic leaders say, we're doing a great job preparing people to go be in the world after they leave the university. There's this massive disconnect. I have the good fortune to work in a lot of different um, uh, disciplinary areas. I've worked with continuing legal education. I've worked with continuing medical education. I work with teacher professional development. I work with library continuing education. I work in a lot of different places. And across the board, you see people representing those economic sectors screaming about the fact that we are not producing graduates who are ready to do work. And I have a theory about this. This is probably the biggest theory part that I have. But again, it's theory based on that data. When I talk to them out there in the world about what they want, and when I look at the ways we are organized in higher education and actually secondary education, we are organized by disciplinary area. We are, nor we are organized based on knowledge. That's a biology department, and that's an informatics department, and that's a philosophy department. And these people are saying, golly, you guys, the conservatory is in the cloud. Knowledge is ubiquitous. Expertise isn't what anybody knows anymore. Expertise is what can somebody do with what they know. How can they critically think? How can they quantitatively reason? How can they problem solve? How can they communicate? How can they be creative in those spaces? All of the things that the AAC and you defined a number of years ago, because they are the liberal and professional education institution advocate, 
in America. They said, you know, these are the things that we do with liberal education. But we don't translate well what we offer into that language that those people who are hiring or who are choosing degrees from us saying, this is the skill set you get. But, re, but trust me, re, expertise is being redefined based on skill set. And we have the capacity, we just haven't learned how to translate that. And it's simply flipping so that another kind of flip is, don't talk about the subject matter first and then the skill second. Talk about the skill first and how the subject matter enhances it. And you do that and you can talk to anybody in the world about what we add as value. Customization to programs and service. We know, and, and particularly in the online space, and this is a big part of the conversation I have within IU, when people can order an Apple computer customized to their exact specifications, have it developed in China, created in China, shipped within 48 hours and delivered on my doorstep, that's an amazing level of customization. And yet we say, okay, you want to apply to higher education institution? Send in your application. We'll give you an answer in five months. We'll let you in in another five months. And we'll give you a series of programs and courses that we tell you when you're going to deliver them. That's not very competitive. And more and more aggressive competition because there are people out there who are doing that more and more. The struggle I see is that they're either weighted, they're highly student focused, but don't have the faculty expertise that our institutions have. Or we're highly faculty focused, we have great faculty and expertise, but we haven't yet figured out that we have to think about the student experience. So where does that lead us? That leads us to a disaggregation of infrastructure. And let me run through this slide a little bit and I'll talk about big data at the end about where are we going to go. Because I think if we recognize the disaggregation that's occurring around the infrastructure of higher education, then we'll know how to take those elements and rebuild them to something that's even better than it was before. So I'm just going to give you all of these kind of in a nutshell really quickly because they feed into each other. First of all, we're experiencing the disaggregation of teaching from certification. MOOCs is teaching. Badges is certification. Right? I think that ultimately, big providers such as ourselves, such as Penn State and Indiana University, or CIC institutions, in 10 years, 20 years, less, I don't know what it's going to look, we're going to have four formats for our academic programs. We're going to have fully on campus for those who can afford it, those who can get here, those who are 18 to 24 years old and need to be here. We're going to have fully online programs for those who somewhere learned how to learn and are self-motivating and self-organizing and who can work in that space. We're going to have hybrid programs that are somewhere in the mix. And we're going to have competency-based programs. We're going to have the opportunity to test out and see what, you, what you've done and be able to fill, fill in the gap where you need to fill in the gap. That's going to be a full service provider. And students are going to select in and out of those pieces. That idea is already sort of happening. And that's what people call swirl now. And that's what I call student intentionality. They know what they want and need. And they're choosing and self-selecting into that. So we have to be prepared for the value added of teaching. And we have to be prepared for the value added of certification. But historically, and this gets to the next point, or the third point, I'll come back to this. The faculty member alone has been responsible for, I design it, I, I know it, I design it, I develop it, I deliver it, I assess the student, and I actually kind of assess myself, because there's no accountability for that. That is disaggregating as well. We talked about how many instructional designers there are at Penn State, and how that number is growing at, in, at Indiana University. We talk about how many instructional technologists we have. We talk about the fact that the teaching, research, and service aspect of a tenured or tenure line faculty member is starting to disaggregate. We're getting more senior lecturers. We're getting more adjuncts. We're getting more research scientists. All of that stuff is disaggregating because the specialization that's needed, the infrastructure that need, that's needed, is becoming so great. And we're having to think about what does that look like. The other exciting thing to me is the disaggregation of the elements of instruction, right? And this is where I think that people who understand instructional design have a real advantage here and a value added of what we bring. And remember that this is in the context of the fact that faculty members at universities became faculty members without actually ever having to know anything about how teaching occurs, right? Because we value discipline knowledge. So they didn't have to have a class on instructional design. They didn't have to learn Gagne's events of instruction, right? They don't have to know that the best way to build a bridge is to reverse engineer it. 
They didn't have to understand that, by golly, I should actually come up with learning outcomes. And then when, once I know the learning outcomes and they're, and they're actually measurable, and that's just a baseline, right? That's not the goal. But if I have a few measurable learning outcomes, then I can say, OK, what assessment will actually best measure if a student has achieved those outcomes? And if I know the assessment, then by golly, I should be saying, what practice and feedback activities should students have in order to be able to pass that assessment when the time comes? What's the range of assessment activities they should have? in both what they see and what they do. And then if I know the assessment, then, or if I know the practice and feedback mechanisms, then I can say, what, do, what should they be able to discuss or say so that they know the, the cognitive signs so that when they go into the practice activity, they'll be able to be thinking about the right things? And what do I have to demonstrate to them so that they'll know what to talk about? And then how do I set them up? What's that introductory lecture that I give them? And how do I motivate them in the first place to understand that this matters? Because trust me, any time a student says to you, how am I going to use this in the real world, they're telling you, you don't even have them at the first plank of the bridge. And so when we talk about gatekeeping versus bridge building, we're talking about the fact that a gate is we're not even allowing students a well-engineered experience. And a bridge can be a bridge but it can have planks missing when we don't reverse engineer it. And students are always here, right? Here's our goal, and here. If they weren't some of the goal, they wouldn't need us, right? So the fact that we have an opportunity to disaggregate those elements of instruction and think about how we put them together in meaningful ways, the conversation I had last night um, with, with, uh, with Gary was really around this idea of thinking about what kind of analytics we'd really ask for if we thought about reversing instructional elements. So I've talked about that. And then the last part is disaggregation of educational roles or educational services. It is amazing to me in my role as executive, uh, whatever my title is, senior director of the Office of Online Education, how many emails I get in my inbox every day from some for-profit educational service company who wants to sell me something, whether it's marketing or whether it's getting faculty for me, or whether it's developing my courses, or whether it's um, doing market analysis. It is unprecedented the amount of services that are now actually being disaggregated from the historical higher education experience. So if that's where we are, how do we move forward in this space? Who's going to win in 20 years? Who's going to be left standing? You read all the prognostication about all of the small schools are going to go away, all the private schools are going to go away, all that's going to happen. I don't think that's true. But I do think that the institutions that have the kind of faculty that we have, the resources that we have, and human resources in places like Penn State and IU, the people who have the facilities and the infrastructure that we have at these kinds of institutions, better start thinking about who we serve. And that's not research. I'm not talking about engagement. I'm not talking about the research arms. I'm talking about the teaching and learning aspect of this. And I'm mindful that we have to think about our mission in education as being bridge building and not gatekeeping. And by that, I mean we really have to understand that students are sacrificing more today than they have ever sacrificed in the entire history of higher education to be here. And it's not acceptable to say, golly, you flunked that class. You're just going to have to pay another $500 worth of tuition and take it again, or whatever that might be. So all of a sudden, we have to think about what what's happening there. And we have to understand, other than those questions about the K-12 or the, the 12th grade freshman year gap, those things that we're talking about in terms of college preparation, that really if students aren't prepared to learn, for about 90% of the students, it's probably not a psychological issue. It's probably not a, a, a personal readiness issue. There are people who have special needs, but they're limited in that way. It's a capacity issue. It's that we didn't prepare them well. So we have to start to understand that the future is going to be student-centered, just in time, just in place, and just as needed. Technologies are allowing to do, us, do that now. We have to understand that the core of good instruction has always been student engagement. It just happened that student engagement may have happened in a Socratic questioning section, or it might have happened in the library with peers afterwards, or it might have happened during office hours. But student engagement has to happen in different ways today than it did in the past. And we need to understand 
what Steve Jobs said about the key to Apple success in the Walter Isaacson biography about that. And one of the takeaways from that was Steve Jobs said what made Apple so great was that they got technology out of the way so that people could do what they wanted to do, whether it was see a video or listen to music. We have to get the infrastructure out of the way so people can learn. I'm forever saying that in Indiana University. Our students don't care about our regional service area. They want the program that they want, when they need it, how they need it. And we have to be ready to, to, to respond to that. And finally, if we think about learning analytics and big data in ways that actually tie to those key instructional elements, we'll start figuring out what I think most of us in instructional design already know. The more interactive, the more engaging, the more modalities that we work to, the more it's tied to learning outcomes, the more likely students are going to be to be successful. The more it's one modality, the, the less likely they will to be successful. And that's who I think is going to win in the future. With that, I'll stop. Terrific. Something tells me, Barbara, you're just getting warmed up. <laughs> Ask me <laughs> well, questions. A lot, of, a lot of great ideas there to, to work on. A couple comments that came off on the, uh, the chat. Uh, Angela mentioned this idea of the competition that, that the university is now um, being forced on. I, I don't know that she was forming a question there, but I'm wondering if you could reflect on that a little bit. Uh, is higher education facing competition from so many different sectors that they have to respond, whereas, I don't know, 50 years ago, there wasn't much in the way of competition? Well, I think that's definitely true, and that's definitely going to be true as you, as you unpackage the value added, the teaching versus the certification. And, and I don't know if anybody's looked online much at General Assembly. Go look at General Assembly and go see what some of these places are charging for certifications that if we're really just about economic development or getting people a job, there's a level there. But then there's the level of preparing people not just for the job, but preparing people for a career. And then there's the preparing people for life and civic engagement, right? And how we bring those things together. And that's where I think we have to stop the false dichotomy between um, education as workforce development, workforce preparation, and education in the liberal arts and, and civic engagement. Because I think if you really talk about at the undergraduate level, those skill sets that everybody needs, whether it's for civic engagement or for personal um, development or for work, it is around those things that the AAC and you mentioned. And so different competitors are offering different alternatives to that. And one of the problems in this, I talked to Renata at some length about this morning. The additional challenge for institutions like IU and Penn State is as we're organizing to face this competition that's external to us, we have multiple campuses that have never had to be in relationship with each other. And they think their competition is with each other. And our job is to try to bring them together and say, how do you guys work together so that we use all of our assets and all of our resources to come up with a solution and put all of our weight and all of the power that we have into this? But we have you know, years, actually, of work to, to change a culture that was, at worst, very competitive and adversarial across campuses, maybe um, just autocratic and not engaged with each other, and to say, you've got to come together, and it's our interest, and you have to trust us as we build this to do it and find the incentives to do that. It's, it's hard work. I guess the alternative is to dig a deeper moat. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so see, let where me that, see, uh, see where that gets you. Uh, in the room here, or we'll watch from online as well. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Just last week, uh, Steve Brint was here. Uh, he written a number of books on higher education. And he was arguing, actually, that um, the competition, uh, which you've been talking about in terms of providing education, can also be looked at in terms of hierarchy. And that, indeed, the privates aren't going to go away. They're going to get even more elite and that universities like Penn State have already created their own elite Shriers Honors College and things like that that are just as hard to get into. Um, so the idea from that perspective is that there's always going to be social status. People are going to seek it out. And then indeed, it will be those elite universities and that elite experience of residential education which will dominate. Right. Um, that would suggest that universities like Penn State are in the tough spot because we compete both with the elites like Harvard for that social status uh, generation, but also then as knowledge providers. So I just wonder if you'd respond to that idea, because I think his take on it and right. the pressures on the university are, are somewhat different than the angle you were describing. Right. Well, and actually, um, uh, Lanny Guinier has just written a book about equity in higher education. I think it's an interesting question. I think it's a question that, that again, Bill Bowen and others are answering 
Um, and it's a question that I heard. Uh, I've had the opportunity also to, to go around to some other institutions and see how they're um, dealing with online education as the disruptive force that it is. Um, there is a clear idea that um, there, is, there is education as a coming of age experience. And there is education that's something other than a coming of age experience. And the coming of age experience is really around what are the private elites and what are the campuses um, such as, as this campus and Indiana University's Bloomington campus doing um, that attracts these people who can be full time, live residentially, have a certain experience, have a massive infrastructure build out. And how is that like and unlike what our regional campuses do, which I have a great deal of respect for. Um, which I think is so critical to our future um, as a society and, and in terms of um, actually beyond society, just not economic development. That's where real democracy lives, right? And when you have students who are you know, incredibly resilient, who are working part time, who are single mothers, who are taking care of people, who are maybe working full time and doing this and, and commuting into campus. So my question is, how do we create a quality of program no matter what the demographic student or the demographic of the student is, so that it really doesn't matter what format under which they're engaging in, we're assured that what they're learning, the skills that they're developing, the network of connections they're creating are value added and help them move in their life so that it's more than just get a job. Um, and, and I have a lot of respect. I work very closely with our community college system and the provost of Ivy Tech Community College. Um, Different kinds of institutions have different missions. There is an aspect of the community college mission that is about getting a job. There is an aspect of what General Assembly does that's about getting a skill set to get me a certain kind of job. But that's not what four-year institutions are doing. I'm heartened, though, by the self-selection that occurs. And I think that if you think about it, I've gone around to all of our campuses. I've talked to a lot of students. I've asked them why they choose the programs they choose why they choose online versus on campus or hybrid or whatever they're doing. And we all know, if, if generally we had all the money in the world, which the wealthiest 1% of people do, right? And we could choose the way we were going to go to school, we would probably have a one-to-one -one tutor, right? We would, we would have somebody following us around, teaching us wherever we wanted to go, or we would have this kind of experience. Generally, there are forces that keep us from that. So the question is, how can we get something that's like a one-to-one -one tutor experience at the lowest possible cost so that more people can have it. And that's why I'm incredibly heartened by the idea of just in time, just in place, and just as needed, or more student engagement. Because really what you're saying there is technologies now afford us the possibility of at a somewhat less expensive level being able to provide a more customized experience for students. And I think that's a phenomenally exciting place to be. Yeah, I um, I taught at Indiana University a course on television 57 years ago, and it was on about our appreciation. And I had, I guess, a dozen students. And I, as I left that class, I always said the ideal student for this kind of distant education class is a rural widow. And I got absolutely no response from that, just a rejection because they don't have any money. And how do we set these things up and so that we can serve people who are poor? Right. Uh, I've developed a sort of a program, think about poor women before clever boys. Right. Uh, how, do we, how do we reach that? Right. Do we well, and, and an interesting, that's a really, really interesting question, and it's a really, really naughty problem. I think the best answer to that has to do with the fact that we have to value the poor rural widow. Or we actually have to value the incarcerated person, right? And another topic. And, and again, what I'm heartened by is that when you look at the national rhetoric around education, you are starting to see over the last five years much language about we need people who have bachelor's degrees. And in fact, there are legislative commitments in the state of Indiana there are big foundations now giving money to going and finding those people who 50 years ago really 
honestly and unfortunately, most people didn't care about getting an education. And now all of a sudden we know that our future as a state and our future mm -hmm. in this nation is to get to those people who, who could learn, who would value the experience of learning and actually find scholarships or find incentives. And also, again, to the work of those economists who are looking at online education to bending the cost curve. It has to be affordable to them either by, by gross, gross or sticker price or it has to be affordable to them through scholarship. And it has to be something that actually is a quality experience for them. It, we have a running joke about you know when worse comes to worse in our state and some of the policies they put in place, like we'll go to, the, to our commissioner who we have a good relationship with and say, do you really want us just to print certificates, print diplomas and hand them out on the street? No, you want the learning that occurs with that. It has to be affordable and we have to get to the people who need it. So how do we use technology to do that? But I do think I see a pattern where um, we are getting much more interest in educating people who historically we haven't been so interested in educating. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so we have a few questions that are emerging online here. Um, uh, Angela, by the way, agrees and, and uh, I think has said this has been part of her experience as well of getting the kind of education and the path that she's taking. Um, there's a question here about, um, Angela's raising the issue of how higher education is relating to the K-12 system. And are we segmented off at grade 13? And, and how are we doing by creating a systemic path? I think that's where, where her question's oriented. Well, and I think, you know, again, there are many of you in the room who probably have just as good answers as I do on this from a practical experience. And I'll actually go point over to Allie and Allie's work in terms of really re-engaging boys, right? Um, and that's critical. And that really is another example of engagement and how critical engagement is. And also when you look at gaming and what's going on with gaming, the whole point of gaming is figuring out what immediate incentives we can provide and what fast feedback. And, and when I talk about the practice and feedback loop as, as the key elements of instruction, let me just say the key element is the feedback, right? Because we are goal-seeking beings. We want to know how we're doing. And gaming helps promote that. And it's engaging in all those things. So, so that was a little bit of a diversion. But it gets to the point that the real disconnect between K-12 and higher education, and this has been in the literature again for a number of years. This isn't new, and this isn't a surprise. But again, I, I did some study in my master's degree of Horace Mann. I studied Horace Mann, and I studied John Dewey. And the interesting thing to me that we need to understand about the whole purpose of K-12 education goes back to why I think it's important to go back to the purpose of higher ed. Horace Mann created the common school model that we live under. When you read Jonathan Messerly's bio, biography of Horace Mann, one of my favorite lines and the scariest line to me in the mix was that the idea of the common school was Horace Mann looking at his father who had been a failed farmer, take the assembly line and become successful. And Horace Mann was a, a, a colleague and a friend of the governor of Massachusetts and the Irish were coming and the Native Americans were arrested and they were trying to figure out how do they keep a mutiny from happening. And they needed a citizenry that was had a common base that so that they were not all warring against each other. And the quote that scares me in in the common in in uh, Messerly's biography about common schools that said Horace Mann was not the least bit interested in the individual child. He was only interested in educating all children as a collective, right? And we know, and John Dewey and everybody ever since, like from the moment, common schools never work, right? But to the extent that they worked, their job was to make us somewhat passive and to have a common baseline of citizenry. They weren't to make us critical thinkers, quantitative reasoners, and all those things. So the big gap, the really big gap between what K-12 does and what, and what university does is to pre prepare people to be independent um, learners and to be able to self-regulate um, self in the learning experience. So that's where institutions that are building bridge programs need to think about, and math and, and English are really our proxy for that. And why are math and English our proxy? Because math is problem solving, and English is developing an argument. Those are the fundamental two skills that we need to get to. So I think thinking about what we want students to get out of K-12 and how we can prepare them for a different, a different idea about what education is for is fundamental in terms of that preparation. Terrific, thank you. Uh, let me see if we have any other questions in the room here. Kyle? 
Thank you, Barbara. How are you doing? I'm good, and you? Nice to see you. Great. So uh, thank you for a wonderful session and for giving me lots to think about. As you were talking, I had, uh, and you talked about the lack of the impact of the internet on higher education. I can't help but feel that uh, part of that is that we hold a monopoly on the only degree that people, the only credential that people seem to value. Other people can't really do that without going through a whole lot. And I, I wonder, first of all, how does this idea of a diploma or degree sit with your just enough, just in place, just as needed concept? And uh, you know, it, will a diploma, will the value of a diploma, is it like a baseball card? In that you know, this collector's baseball card is worth something only because people say it's worth something. Right. And will that change? So change happens along a curve and it gets, you know, we're, I think we're in a pretty steep right. segment of that change curve. Right. And um, so how did, how did these things come, how do we personalize well, and yet have these massive things that people uh, are locked into right. and so on? Well, Kyle, I'm, I'm, you've set me up to actually basically strongly agree with something that you're already promoting, which is that idea of when you disaggregate the value added with the certificate or the credential, um, the real innovation, I think, is going to come when we, when we do what you're already talking about doing, and that is recognize that we need a certificate that actually has some weight behind it. And that's really what Lumina Foundation has been trying to do with moving um, the degree qualifications portfolio from the EU over into the US. But again, our challenge with that is what faculty members have been actually taught how to write a good learning outcome, right? And, and how we use, instead of credit hours, and or in our parlance, butts and seats, you know, as, as the measure of learning to the actual demonstrated, codified experience that I mastered a learning outcome by doing these things. So I think that when you partner competency, the idea of competency-based education and a, a measure of learning outcomes and degree portfolios, and you can show how a student got it, that's why I think that's going to be in the mix of those four models. So at, at a university like ours, we can either certify through competency-based education and stamp that you got it somehow as you pieced it together and we assess you or test you, one of the things that you're talking about, or we can say, you know, you're not, you're, you're not even close. You're 18 years old. You have no reason to have these experiences. You can try to test out of some things if you want to. You can try to actually demonstrate that you've gotten these competencies in some ways. But if you don't, we've got the full suite of educational experiences you need to have in order to get you to those competencies. So, I think that's where that disaggregation matters, and that's where I think institutions like ours are best poised to do that, because WGU can do what WGU does, but they don't really have the, the faculty in order to support people who are not adult learners, who don't bring a lot of life experience. Um, some of the competency-based things that are going on with Wisconsin, well, Wisconsin's kind of moving where we're moving from a different angle. Um, so they could have that capacity, but they've separated out competency-based education. Um, and, and I think the other thing I'm heartened by, I'm not so worried about Arizona State's massive national advertising scheme at this point in time because engagement really is a human activity. And ultimately, education is a human experience. And ultimately, if I'm going to spend some dollars, to the extent that I can connect with somebody in virtual dimensions, it's back to Daphne Kohler's point about they all showed up together and talked. So, I don't think people are going to drift too far away from a place where they can go and congregate with other people. And maybe I'm just deluding myself on that, but I think virtual reality is still virtual. And I know that there are companies that are working on how we can smell through the internet, you know, and do some things, but I still want to be, you know, right there. I want to see you in all three of your dimensions if I can. I want to actually be able to engage with you. And and so I think ultimately to have a hybrid experience and have the various aspects will matter, but, but back to your presenting question, we've never had to state learning outcomes before. We've never been held accountable to learning outcomes before, so we certainly couldn't be measured on them, and we couldn't certainly tie a diploma to them. And again, this isn't unprecedented. The EU's done this. Now we just got to figure out how we incorporate that into the mix of the service and experiences that we provide. Thank you. Terrific. Well, I'm watching our time here, Barbara, and um, you, you nailed it. You're right on. So thank you so much. And, and again, thank you for joining us at Penn State and sharing your, your thoughts, your visions, uh, your hope for the future. It's been terrific uh, engaging with you and, and uh, 
I hope the rest of your time here is as enjoyable. Thank you. Well, it's been my pleasure. Um, just I've learned so much already. I know I have an afternoon full of, of learning a lot more. Um, but I, I do appreciate your listening to my perspective. I will remind you, it's a perspective. But it's a perspective that there's nothing in any of those slides that I talked about that isn't already happening. It's just trying to put those together to tell a story about what might it lead to. The last slide was the only slide that said, here's what you need to think about in the future. But that is a systems view. That's the value of what we in our field know about thinking about education as a system. And what are the pieces that we have to look at and what are those connections? So I hope it was helpful, at least provocative a little bit. And, uh, and I wish you well in whatever you do. Please join what me in thanking Barbara. Thank you.